welcome here this evening. Good to have you here. Seems as though the weather's kept some people away. <laughs> um, it's um, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Griki Verhoef, who is a professor in accounting, economics, and business history. The history is a very po important part of it because uh, she does regard history as being um, important as far as economics is concerned. That if you don't know the history, you don't understand how, how countries function. She's published contributions to 16 books and two monographs on business and insurance, research publication in economic business and accounting history of South Africa. She's completed research projects on development of corporate business in South Africa and Africa. Her research spans the development of financial institutions in Africa and South Africa, voluntary savings organizations, colonial economic growth and the development of the insurance industry. Her latest publication is The History of Business in Africa, Complex Discontinuities in to Emerging Markets. And forthcoming is The Power of Your Life, The Somnum Century of Insurance Empowerment. As far as history and, and economics is concerned, if you take the kind of work that the Free Market Foundation does um, and our publication uh, that we're part of, Economic Freedom of the World, you can see how things happen and what makes countries um, great, what makes them, um, uh, what makes the people wealthy. You look at uh, Hong Kong. When the war ended in 1945, Hong Kong was desolate and destitute. The British came back there and they had the good fortune to have Sir John Cowperthwaite as the head of the administration, uh, particularly the economy. And he had a, a very interesting way of looking at things. Uh, he, his, his idea is, as far as government was concerned, that the best thing they could do was to do nothing. And Hong Kong today is still number one on the Economic Freedom of the World uh, booklet and has been like that since 1980. You look at Mauritius. In 2007, they took some dramatic decisions. They are now number seven in the world as far as economic freedom is concerned. And this is the kind of thing that is so interesting and we look forward to hearing you, Professor, talk about <coughs> the history of Africa and South Africa. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, as a historian, my focus is primarily on the historical processes in the development of business in Africa. So in the book, one finds a whole host of cases, stories about examples of successful enterprise. Um, and th the tragic part of the story is that there was a time when African governments themselves undermined the growth of their enterprises. And subsequent to that, um, f fails to provide the environment for those enterprises to revive and really <coughs> be the strength of the economies. So in, in my presentation here, I, pr you know, I'll, I would give you some idea of how I was looking at entrepreneurship. So I'm not going to do the theory, but you will probably all be very familiar with, with the, the work of Cantillon, who uh, focused on the arbitrage role of the entrepreneur, a person who would take the risks and who would deal with uncertainty, um, 
says work on the on the middleman and the strong emphasis on the personal traits of the individual, uh, uh, the, his the um, entrepreneur's judgment, his perseverance, resourcefulness, knowledgeableness, experience, um, and and his ability to to deal with with uh, uncertainty. These are the the elements of the entrepreneur that emerged um, right through the history and have, have become important traits that we need to look at in the development of a business in Africa. So Frank Knight's work is also very well known with his em emphasis on, on the entrepreneur's profit and uh, his, his taking of the profit as a reward for him taking the risk, uh, measuring that risk. Um, and then the the very well known is Schumpeter's emphasis on the creative destruction, the role of innovation, and the fact that the entrepreneur just changes the entire environment in which he lives and is therefore also an agent of social change because of his ability to deal with, with innovation. The conventions of technology are not the boundaries of his operation, but he changes that. And then Mark Casson says, uh, the Entrepreneur is the hero, he's the innovator, he is the individual that shifts the paradigm altogether. And this is the background against which I look at the development of business in Africa. In the uh, period prior to colonialism, one finds very strong training networks. Um, this is the one thing that we should not discount about the development of business in Africa. In the period pre before colonial control, there are very, very strong ideas of enterprise, networks, and the transition from one generation to the other in perpetuating these entrepreneurial activities. Um, in, the, in, in, in much of the debate about uh, economic development in, in Africa, the focus is so strong, very strong on Africa as a unity and, and the, the desire for Africa to eradicate poverty and Africa to, to grow economically. But the one thing that we should accept and remember about Africa is the fact that Africa is not a unity. It has never been and the diversity in Africa is actually the reason why there were very strong centers of growth in the past. If you look at the pre-colonial um, uh, trading networks, the wealth of Africa was primarily concentrated in the western parts of Africa. That's where the strong kingdoms were and where the strong monarchs generated their trade in, in uh, uh, primary resources and in humans. And only subsequent to the termination of that did these uh, um, traditional uh, uh, authorities have to try and find alternative sources of exchange. So the, the diversity in Africa is, is key. The fact that there was never ever equality, there were always strong hierarchies of power and control, and they were, they were uh, undisputed control by um, non-democratic forces, so the, the inherited uh, aristocracy of, of, the, of the monarchy was, was uh, in power. But it's important to, to seek out the coexistence with private enterprise. In the early periods of the strong kingdoms in West Africa, one finds that the monarch remained in very close dynamic relationships with private enterprise and allowing the private enterprise to perform their functions, to do their uh, uh, cultivation of crops, their exchange of crops, their, their sourcing of resources, to do that in collaboration with the stronger network con controlled by the um, monarchy. So <clears throat> there is, there's no equity. The, the king and the chief remained in control, but that dynamic relationship with private entrepreneurs was always there. And one of the interesting examples is that of John Saba, uh, uh, an entrepreneur on the Gold Coast who in the 19th century um, made massive inroads in developing 
a very powerful network of exchange of, of trading businesses. But the key uh, uh, variable in his makeup that made him successful is his utilization of Western education. He went to a missionary school and he used documents, uh, English uh, documents, explaining how an, uh, an enterprise works, how functions are um, uh, distinguished from each other within an enterprise. Who would have to take control? Who would manage? Who would control resources? Who would look after finances? So very basic principles of running an enterprise was handed down to him through his access to Western education, that was uh, uh, missionary education in, in West Africa. And from there he developed this strong enterprise network and a very strong family enterprise. Now, unfortunately, around about the time of decolonization, he became very involved in the political processes in, in uh, Ghana, in the Gold Coast, which became Ghana, and he find his, his enterprise finally uh, collapsed. But he was successful in that period when he gave his attention to the enterprise. Um, the, the next phase of um, entrepreneurship in Africa is that of colonial entrepreneurship. Um, one, one tends to think because of lots of the propaganda about the destruction of colonialism and the exploitation of colonialism and suppression of colonialism, one, one tends to think because of, of these ideas that entrepreneurship was, was um, uh, thrashed completely, suppressed completely, and, and African uh, uh, entrepreneurs performed no role within the colonial um, economy. What is true is that the commanding heights of the colonial economy were definitely in the control of the colonial powers. They had to make their colonies pay, so they ensured that they gained sufficient revenue, not always sufficient, but as much as they possibly could, revenue from the operations of that enterprise, so they, of, of that colony. So they would control the major trading routes and they would ensure that the British chartered companies or the uh, French chartered companies would have preferential access to resources for the export of, res of, of commodities. But the, the chartered companies performed an important role in entrepreneurial development by employing some of these um, uh, uh, entrepreneurs from the African environment as, as suppliers of commodities or uh, the, the so-called uh, middleman role, uh, suppliers of, of, of commodities, but also the distributors of com commodities that came in from the exp import trade into the rest of, of the colony. So there was definitely market distortion through colonial control, there's no doubt about it. But if one controls the distortion by the colonial powers to the distortion of the autocratic rule of the kings and the monarchs in the past, there are similarities. It is the state in one form or the other Im um, impacting on the free movement of the entrepreneur as well as the free mov mov movement of goods. Um, in the book, I regard South Africa as an outlier in several places in the book, I refer to uh, some case studies on South Africa for the simple reason that in, in the time that we then col consider colonial control, which is from about the late 1880s up until the 1960s, that's the period of high colonialism or imperialism in Africa. In that period, South Africa was no longer a colony, but South Africa had minority white rule. So although it's not a free open democracy, um, it's, not a colon it's not colonial uh, control, but in that environment, the, the uh, government of the South African state introduced policies to segregate economic activity, not necessarily crush it. So of course, it was not possible for African entrepreneurs operating in urban areas to extend their operations right across the country, and especially when the uh, um, policies of separate development in the late 1940s became more rigid and more comprehensive, 
um, th though that dispensation contained the more in, into their uh, segregated areas. But the, the South African state um, encouraged the development of African entrepreneurship. Um, from the period of the 1940s onwards, one finds that African leaders who were um, engaged in the missionary schools, some of, some of the uh, African ministers encouraged their young people and those who came to the urban areas to engage in enterprise, to use the opportunity of their educate the Western education and translate that into opportunities in business. So there was a strong encouragement of, the, of African entrepreneurs within their own environment. And in, in the South African case, then in the 1920s, and 30s, one finds a, a well-known figure, you probably know his name, Selope Tema, who in 1938 established um, the African Business League. And that's the late 30s. And that can only happen if there are suffi a sufficient numbers of African businessmen around and f uh, experiencing the need for collaboration, for networking, and mutual support in, in their business endeavors. So from Selope Tema's uh, African Business League, one see the em emergence of the Orlando Trading Association, and finally in the 1960s, it became NAFCOC that we know very well today. So African entrepreneurship has always been encouraged, and it's really been growing very strongly despite segregation policies. Whereas in the, in the colonial environment, the, the, the confines were uh, defined by the colonial policies. In the South African environment, the confines were defined by the segregation policies, more and less strict in, in different periods of time. But the segregation uh, uh, policies nevertheless encourage forms of innovation. And it, it's interesting to look at the, the new ideas that emerged in urban areas. Um, one that you will probably remember very well is that of um, uh, Herman Shikane, who established the cane um, furniture enterprise in Soweto. And, you know, his enterprise grew fairly quickly because it's, a, it's uh, less uh, um, costly resources, material, it's not solid wood that he was working with. Uh, Buying cane was not too difficult. It's, it's not a very heavy furniture that he manufactures. It's easy transportable. So it's, that's a commodity or a product that would, would gain access into the market fairly quickly. And he expanded his operations very, very quickly. And his expansion finally came when the apartheid authorities said to Shakane, you can no longer continue with your manufacturing of uh, this, this, this big uh, furniture enterprise in Soweto, you have to go to one of the homelands. So the Bantu Investment Corporation gave him funding and land north of Pretoria near Hamanskral, and that's the basis of his expansion from where he established an, an extensive enterprise and finally became the main supplier to OK Furniture stores of cane furniture. So. The point is, if we reflect back on what it really may, takes to be a good entrepreneur, the personal traits, the, the courage, the, the um, idea to um, innovate, to take technology a step further, to break the confines of the environment, to think new, to persevere, to build the knowledge of what, what would people need and pr provide in, the, at, in that demand, that's what Shakane, Herman Shakane did. And, and finally, he was, well, I, I think he's still alive in, in his late 80s at present, but he was rewarded for that very, very um, richly by his entrepreneurial endeavors. And the state provided support for him to go in that direction. Um, there are also in this period the, the names that you most probably will know very well, that of um, Solile Solang, who started the um, supermarket chain, the black chain supermarket in, in Soweto, actually a wholesale chain uh, with the intention of supplying smaller outlets within in townships. Uh, the black chain supermarket finally 
uh, went under because of the strong competition of competing change such as the OK food stores and pick and pay that rose to prominence since the 19th, mid 70s and checkers. And you know, it's the, the, the township inhabitants went to work in, in urban areas outside the townships, did their shopping then brought their, their baskets back home. So the, the demand for the black chain um, wholesale supplies was, was really competing to the existing change in, in, in the white area. Um, then Richard Maponia, who you all know very well, Maponia started in the urban area, in, in the uh, urban, um, township area of, of Soweto with second-hand clothing where he worked. He was trained as, an, as a, a teacher, started working for a, a clothing retailer, did very good in buying in, in, in buying good clothes and, and attracting uh, um, uh, Africans to, to buy the, the, the quality garments within that store. And then with the change of management, he was um, overseen because he was a black man and the next person was, was a European. And then he said, well, if I'm not promoted, then I'm going to do my own thing. And then he, he started trading with secondhand clothing. And then his second-hand clothing shop in, in Soweto grew. And finally, from there, uh, government said, you don't have a license to, to sell clothing. You can't have a clothing store in Soweto. So um, the, the rules and regulations of, uh, around what the blacks could do in, in townships was, was contracting his market. So we said, well, I'll try something else. He went into milk sales. And then from milk sales, he went into automobiles and and so on. And so finally, Richard Maponia built up the empire that he uh, runs at, at present. The, the Kunene brothers, you all pr probably know very well, also starting with just in, in Fosloris selling uh, milk and, and uh, fruit juices, expanding and finally uh, gaining the, the contract to do the bottling of Coke and expanded into an, a high a number of other diverse enterprises. But the point is, in the urban areas, very strong entrepreneurial traits were visible amongst uh, black uh, uh, entrepreneurs. They displayed their ability to take opportunity of these circumstances, despite the uh, confines that the, the, the legislation around segregation placed on their operations. They used what they could and made the best of that. And, and then the important point is that they accumulated savings. And most of the black enterprises started off using their own savings. Savings that they accumulated, applied, put it back into their enterprise, and, and in that way expanded. And then when they had lots to save, they had bank accounts. It's also an absolute myth that, that black people in this country didn't have access to banks. They, they always had access to banks. It's the question of whether they could get credit from the banks. Could they provide the type of guarantees that the commercial banks generally required? That's a different story, but their access to banking services was, was open right from the start. So um, I also refer to the Mia families, you know them very well in, in um, angling supplies as all as well as there's two the Mia family was one family but they split into two the one is in, in wholesaling and the other one into angling supplies and the Dokrat family with big hardware store in, in Pretoria both the Mia families and the Dokrat families are on their fourth generation of big family enterprises today so in the South African environment despite the uh, restrictions of policies of segregation that one could compare to colonial restrictions, entrepreneurship amongst Africans flourished. But the, um, the negative side, and this is the discontinuity that we talk about in the, in the history of business in Africa, is independence and the whole ideology of socialism, the state that should emerge, central planning, and, and the role of the state as the vanguard of the people, and that the state should own the commanding heights. That resulted in the emergence of uh, an, a massive uh, state-owned enterprise sector in the, in the African economy, which for a very long time, from about the 1960s up until the mid-1980s, 
was really r responsible for much of the economic slowdown in Africa. There are hardly SOEs that one could name that were successful. The, the, the most successful SOE <laughs> was the South African one, Sasol, which was an SOE but was privatized in 79. And subsequent to that, it became the champion of globalization. But, but most of the other state-owned enterprises in Africa really failed their nations and did not contribute to um, economic growth. And it stifled entrepreneurial opportunities because the, the, the state controlled the, the, the vast si uh, a portion of the economies with the result that the small enterprise really had very few opportunities of making inroads. And then that, was th that is the reason why in the literature there is often reference to the so-called missing middle. What happened to this smaller entrepreneur? Not just the informal uh, trader or uh, small trader alongside the road, but the, the, the entrepreneur that has established a business that is now engaged in network trading, as we've seen prior to colonialism, and sustained under colonial rule. The, those people disappeared to a large extent in the period of independence. So the new elite and their um, relationship with socialism was negative for Africa and it really undermined entrepreneurial activity. But despite this, we still find, and the, the book gives us an, a lot of examples of small ent entrepreneurs finding their way in this myriad of state-owned enterprises and regulation. In Ghana, we find the emergence of Lebanese people who immigrated to Ghana. They're in the third generation in Ghana at present, but they established big enterprises in engineering and construction, in sawmilling. In Nigeria, there's the Darko family who started with poultry farming and, and has extensive poultry interests across West Africa today. But it started in the period uh, to, uh, under colonialism and continued subsequent to that. And then there is the Dangote. You probably know the Alicote Dangote cement empire very well today. But he's the grandson of Dantata, Al Hassan Dantata who was an entrepreneur in Nigeria in the period of colonial rule. And under colonial rule established an extensive transport business. And, and when finally um, the, the, the uh, founder of that business died, the next generation uh, continued with the, with the exchange of kola nuts. And then the, the grandson, Alikote Dangote, was sent for proper education in a private school in, in, um, in, uh, in Europe, came back and then gradually started building his empire. But the catchphrase with Dangote is the relationship to the state. So this is a golden thread that runs through the history of post-independence Africa, is the relationship to the state was the key to the success. And that is problematic in, in the sense that the element of risk is taken away because there is the assumption that you will get the contract of the state to perform the business. And Dangote um, positioned himself very strongly with respect to the ruling party in uh, Nigeria. He financed uh, one of the presidential candidates' presidential campaigns. He, that, that person, uh, Obasanyo, then became the president of, of Nigeria. He was favored in the, in, the, in the time when licenses were handed out for uh, uh, very valuable contracts to manufacture cement. So he built up his em empire. In the same way, I am reluctant to regard the people who've, ra who've risen to prominence under black economic empowerment in South Africa regard them as the real entrepreneurs because the, 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 the shielding of the risk environment through statutory protection and statutory prescription of ownership and, and control and so on, so on is very different from the, the actual risk that the entrepreneur himself has to take and has taken in many instances in Africa. But in the in independent period, there were successful entrepreneurs that managed 
or negotiated the complex environment. But it's, it's not um, um, the, the full opportunity of, of independence was actually lost as a result of the overarching role that the state played through state-owned enterprises. I also refer to the policies of indigenization, which is the more generic term that we would refer to. Our, our own black economic empowerment is basically one form of indigenization. In no instance in Africa has ind indigenization actually been successful in nurturing strong economic growth and strong entrepreneurial activity because of the, um, the role that the, the preferential treatment and the protection of risk within the market is provided through this system. The interesting thing is that Namibia last week, I think, has just decided to scrap their empowerment policies because the argument is it did not achieve the aims it set out to achieve. So, um, in general, indigenization programs were introduced right across Africa, Nigeria and Kenya post-independence with very little success in really nurturing entrepreneurial activity. And it actually made it very difficult for the real entrepreneurial families to succeed because they weren't in that favorable position aligned to political power. Um, in, in the South African environment, in, in this instance, independence is 1960s. I'm talking about South Africa in the 1960s. I'm looking at the BIC, uh, Bantu Investment Corporation, as the, the source of nurturing of black entrepreneurs. And in this uh, instance, I wanted to refer to um, uh, the second name here. I, I spoke about Shekwane, but the one I want to refer to here is Mr. Mayapa, who was working with the Transkai Development Corporation in the Transkai. So he had basic schooling, but he was employed by the Bantu Investment Corporation in the, in the early 1970s. And he learned business administration through his his employment at the Bantu Investment Corporation. And after about 10 years with the Transkai Investment Corporation, he said he would also now wish to apply for a loan and he wanted to start his own enterprise because he's now learned enough, enough about how to run a business and do the administration. He got the funding from, from the uh, Transkai Investment Corporation. He bought two small bakeries and he established very successful bakeries in the Transkai, expanded into a whole network of bakeries, and the next thing he was interested in was in hotels, so he bought up a small hotel, expanded into a, a, a larger one, a more modern one, and eventually Mr. Mayapa became a very, very uh, wealthy, <laughs> wealthy businessman in the Transkai, um, actually supporting po policies of segregation because the policies of segregation actually wanted the entrepreneurs to develop within their own environment and develop in decentralized areas away from where the nucleus was so that there would be a, a dispersion of the interests of the entrepreneurs. Well, of course, there are restrictions to the market through the policies of segregation, but in, in certain sense, opportunities were also created. Um, then I refer to the work of Herman Mashaba, you know him very well, our current mayor, with, with his uh, in, engagement with um, cosmetics, uh, joined up with a chemical engineer, got the product off the market and took the, the risk of, of distributing um, that product and then finally diversified and then he reached a stage where he says, black like me is not making enough money and I don't have to do all the work, I will now just sell out my, my share and uh, engage in the investment opportunities that black economic empowerment is providing me. And, and he did it, and, and very successfully so. Uh, Ramahaha is a, a very interesting lady in Soweto who was the first person in Soweto to establish a nursery, which is also an indication of an individual Noticing the need for people in Soweto to make gardens and make it beautiful in the environment and, and finding pleasure in gardening itself. And she, was, she saw the opportunity, used it and, and started a very successful enterprise in, in, in the first nursery in Soweto. Stanley and Corsi was the first black man to establish a black recording studio. So he knew the, the um, 
love of music and he attended the music events in, in his township, but he realized we needed to record these and distribute the recorded um, uh, uh, music. So this is the, the type of opportunities that the entrepreneurs observed, made use of and successfully established themselves in, in South Africa. Now these examples in South Africa are, uh, we, we can match fairly easily with similar examples in Africa. The interesting point is that in the 21st century, the number of successful South African black businessmen surpass that of <coughs> successful uh, uh, black businessmen in the rest of the continent. And I argue that that is the case because of the nurturing of entrepreneurship in South Africa, despite the fact that segregation was um, um, sustained. Um, the, the next slide then refers to the period of African entrepreneurial rebirth. And this comes then when Africa really experienced serious problems with the debt crisis in the mid-1980s as a result of, well, it really started with the oil crisis and then the debt rising in Africa and African countries simply being uh, suffocated by their debt and the international organizations actually stepped in. And then the NEPAD charter finally um, uh, uh, formulated the vision of re returning Africa to, to its um, former glory and nurturing economic growth through entrepreneurial activity. And this is the first time after the structural, the, the controversial structural adjustment programs of the mid 80s, early 1990s, that African initiative through NEPAD and the African Renaissance emphasized the necessity of Africans to revive their <coughs> continent. So in the book, I write extensively on the dire straits in which Africa was by the 1990s. Um, the the uh, uh, periodical, the economists talk about the, the shackled continent. Um, no opportunity really for, for growth was expected. And then the turnaround came and in the early 2000s, the economists acknowledged Africa was rising. And this rise in Africa was really because liberal market policies were gradually being reintroduced in the states, in the independent states. But as we also experience in South Africa with very strong limitations, um, the, the, the legacy of the state in Africa and the um, interference in the market by the state in Africa prior to, to uh, um, independence, perpetuated in much higher degree post-independence, is still present in the period of revival now. Um, if one just thinks about what had happened in Zimbabwe, the role of the state was really the agent in undermining the growth of that economy. And the, the, the state undermined the ability of entrepreneurs to sustain themselves, so they left Zimbabwe. It's not as if Zimbabwe didn't have the entrepreneurs. Um, the, the, his name has now flown out of my mind, but there's an entrepreneur who started uh, an internet-based company in Zimbabwe and has, has now expanded into the rest of, of, of uh, South and Eastern Africa. But now that the opportunity is again rising for him in, in Zimbabwe to um, engage in his business, and, and the state is, is allowing entrepreneurs to, to take advantage of opportunities, we will see a recovery in the Zimbabwean economy. But in, in this period of rebirth, um, Kenya is a very good example of the opportunities of revival in Africa post the independent state. Despite the fact that Kenya was never socialist, the, the political nepotism of the Kenya African National Union and the dominant uh, ethnic entity, the Kikuyu, of the Kikuyu people, uh, resulted in, in contraction of that market. Um, strong nepotism ensured that state-owned enterprises were handed out to, to the loyalists of the government. But in the period now after the rebirth, after, the 19, uh, after 2000, we see a much stronger uh, emphasis in in Kenya on the uh, ability 
of uh, relying on the ability of the entrepreneur to take Kenya a step forward. Um, in this period, um, I refer to very, for, uh, very important family networks. This is something that, especially in East Africa, but not exclusively in East Africa, was very important right through the colonial period, prior to colonialism, through the colonial period, through the period of, of state, uh, strong state control under state-owned enterprises. Uh, leading families have engaged in small trading family, general trading family uh, 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 businesses. And those enterprises accumulated uh, savings. And when the opportunity arose, when privatization gradually uh, entered the debate again after um, uh, the, the late 1990s in 2000, these were the families with the capital uh, uh, able to buy uh, failing state-owned enterprises and remold them into successful enterprises. In the case of um, uh, especially Ethiopia, the Mohan Kotari family, the Kotari family has established the very strong Mohan PLC group, which is engaged in diversified industrial production, but they also do use their knowledge of uh, industrial chemicals to uh, manufacture shoes, so easy, comfortable walking shoes, um, is also part of the manufacturing within the Kotari group. But the, the phenomenon is these families resurface. They're very often Asian families, but they've been in those countries for three, four generations. They are no longer Indians. They are Tanzanians, they are Kenyans, they are Ethiopians, they are um, Ugandans. So they are people who've been there for three, four generations. They, they're African. <laughs> um, and they have emerged as the, the, the new leaders in, in big conglomerate development, especially in East Africa. So um, uh, in, in Tanzania, there's the Bag Bagresa family that has started with financial development and expanded operations into industrial production subsequent to the acquisition of failing state-owned enterprises. In Tanzania, you fa exactly the same thing happened. The Sawiris group, in the Sawiris family in Egypt, started um, their, their uh, very big um, uh, real estate and construction companies and expanded operations right across the Middle East. Um, the the uh, Devji group, the, the Devji family, um, developed a very strong metal group in, in Tanzania, also with, with strong emphasis on, on IT um, uh, and, and uh, finance and microfinance. Um, in, in Botswana, there's a the very interesting example of the Haskins group. They're in, in um, uh, ironware and, and hardware stores at present, but the Haskins family started in the, in the late 1890s as a family from, from, from England establishing a general trading enterprise and they continued their enterprise, expanded into, into clothing and, and blankets and finally back into hardware stores. But the Haskins group is in the fourth generation in, in Botswana now. Um, they, they're Europeans from, you know, originally from, from England, but, but they're Botswana citizens and there's no, nobody in, in Botswana asks a question about their race, they're Botswana citizens. But they have nurtured entrepreneurial activity within Botswana and um, enabled that enterprise to grow and sustain itself. So the general trading companies have really been the champions of diversification in, in many instances in, in East Africa, um, less so in Zambia. It's very interesting that, that the, the Patel, the Mohamed Patel group in, in Zambia now is, is actually developed by a man who's lived his life in Kenya. But finally, because of the, the opportunity in the Zambian market, uh, moved his enterprises over to, to Zambia. So the, the, there, there are many examples of how these entrepreneurs observed the opportunity for innovation and in the Schumpeterian uh, um, destructive capitalist way uh, 
innovated on the basis of the small enterprise and used their knowledge and experience to take risks in new environments. Um, in, uh, yeah, in, in Uganda, there is a very interesting example of the Madhvani group. And these people were uh, Indian, uh, Asian people, and they were expelled under Idi Amin. But when Idi Amin was ousted and they, they were allowed to come back to Uganda, they were handed back their assets, which was not the case for people who were ex Asian people who were expelled from Tanzania and Kenya. But the Madhvanis got their assets back in, in uh, Uganda and as, is now in control of a massive diversified conglomerate from agro-businesses into um, uh, uh, paper and saw milling into clothing manufacturing, into different kinds of food distribution. So um, the, the entrepreneurial traits runs in families in, ma in many instances, but the families have succeeded in, in sustaining those enterprises across generations. So um, the, the, the real market distortion that remains in the period of rebirth is uh, massive corruption and that relationship to the state because the state remains a, a very strong agent within economic development in Africa. That is to the, to the detriment of, of the development of these um, enterprises um, in Africa. The, the interesting thing is then the very modern era of which I could actually really teach you very little, you will know all of this. Um, this is the, the expansion of big enterprise into the global in, environment. Um, and, and my research into what I call emerging, uh, multi, em, emerging market multinationals, not just multinationals as we know them from the US or the UK, but emerging market multinationals, the, the largest number of emerging market multinationals from Africa, not unexpectedly though, are from South Africa. These would be SAB Miller, you know them very well. MTN is a new kid on the block, but a very successful emerging market multinational. NASPARS, um, which is very interesting, you know, it started off with the 1918 establishment of an Afrikaanse courant, De Burger in the Cape, and finally expanded operations into digital media and the, the digital um, business environment. And we all know about its relationship with Tencent in China. Now they're selling it, it off and the share price is, is taking a knock as a result of that. But the point is, NASPARS is the largest emerging market multinational in the world. There's no other emerging market that has a, 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 a larger multinational than, than NASPARS. So we'll see whether NASPARS protects its, its uh, image. And uh, gold fields of South Africa expanding massively from South Africa into mining in the rest of Africa. Anglo-American, I don't list there because Anglo has actually moved its base to London, so it's no longer using its South African listing as a primary listing. But um, the interesting thing is that we are now um, vi um, witnessing the growth of m multinationals from other African countries, and Morocco is beginning to teach us a very valuable lesson. Um, although um, Morocco is not a democracy, it's still under the king, it is really a benevolent king. <laughs> the king is appointing people uh, that are knowledgeable, people that are experienced businessmen to run the enterprises and to, to uh, um, encourage enterprise development and nurture enterprise development. Um, one area where Africa is, is increasingly uh, growing its, its muscle is in the banking sector. I refer there to Wafa Bank that was established in Morocco and expanded into, into West Africa from Nigeria. There's the Guarantee Bank and the Zenith Bank. Um, from Kenya, there's Equity Bank. And from Togo, there's Echo Bank. The interesting thing is that the, the, the uh, three uh, entrepreneurs who started the Echo Bank did so, uh, they, they're from um, Senegal and, and West African, uh, uh, French-speaking West African nations, but they, they chose Togo 
as the most conducive environment to establish the basis of their bank. And Ecobank is currently the fastest growing and the strongest African-owned bank in West Africa and is gradually penetrating into Central Africa as well. Um, I'm not talking here about the South African banking groups because it's, it's a different phenomenon in the sense that um, the South African banking groups have always been very strong and they've been nurtured by the protectionist policies of the South African government from the 1970s on re requiring majority shareholding of Afri South African financial institutions to be in South Africa, which then meant that you know Barclays sold out and, and First National was established with South African capital, it's the insurance companies taking over that shareholding. And, and well, for strategic reasons, the South African government did that in the period of sanctions and, and isolation. And that really nurtured these banks and established massive concentration in our financial services sector, as you know, which, is, which has given them a competitive edge. And, and, and the sophistication of their management and their uh, resources uh, just makes them a very staunch competitor for any other bank in the rest of Africa. But these other banks in, in, in West Africa, primarily from Morocco and Togo, is, is giving us a good run for our money in that environment. Um, then the, the Dangote Group, um, there's a lot in the book about the Dangote Group, but um, I'm skepti skeptical about the praises of Ali Kote Dangote because of his very strong uh, links to government. Um, it's the, the, the responsibility for success is not solely his entrepreneurial um, abilities. Um, then I also refer to the, the, the Sawiris family in Egypt uh, as a strong um, example of current uh, dynamic growth. The Kotari group in e Ethiopia as a diversified group uh, from very general trading uh, routes. And then the very interesting thing is the emergence of the very young, bright, new entrepreneurs. And I single out two very interesting ones from Kenya. The one is Kamal Budabati, uh, Budabati who has established the Craft Silicon Group, which is a, a very big finan financial services software company. Um, and Kamal Budabati has established himself uh, in Kenya because of the opportunities within that market and the conducive uh, policies for especially uh, electronic business, um, mobile banking, um, the IT sector, uh, their uh, success around M-Pesa. Um, so he was capitalizing on that and he, he has developed an, an enterprise that, although based in Kenya, has now expanded into the Middle East and to the, across the north of the Maghreb, which is the, the uh, Muslim Arab parts of, of North Africa. The other one is uh, Ashish Takar with the Mara Group. Now, Ashish Takar's parents were uh, um, Asian people living in Kenya, but they were expelled and they then went back to the UK, but wanted to come back to, to Kenya, which they finally did via Rwanda. And eventually Ashish went back to Kenya, although he was born in in London from uh, Kenyan Asian parents, he came back to, to Kenya and he has established a very successful finance and microfinance group. And he is uh, spending a lot of time and lots of money on entrepreneurial development of small enterprise funding, providing fi finance, providing uh, skills, training and providing support for new entrepreneurs in Kenya. So the Mara group in Kenya is, is, is also uh, an emerging market uh, conglomerate. It has also expanded into, uh, into Dubai and other parts of the, of, uh, the Middle East. But he's, he's the, the, the epitome of new entrepreneurs that, that emerge in Africa. So um, I'm at risk of, of lots of criticism because I haven't mentioned the names of all the very young and upcoming entrepreneurs in South Africa. You know, there are people who started, um, young uh, black people who started uh, share trading enterprises. There are those who started with, with mobile products. Uh, one of my students has connections with somebody who has developed an app for stock files to, to link up 
with their with uh, co-stock files and and uh, access resources and these kind of entrepreneurial activities are growing um, but but it is because there there are opportunities for growth but the opportunities for growth are still stifled by the, the typical problems that Africa had suffered from in the past, such as the um, uh, excessive interference by the state in, into, in market activities, too large government, excessive regulation, um, as well as the corruption of politicians. It seems as if the ability of politicians to distance themselves from the, from the uh, economic environment um, is, is really a serious problem in Africa. So, uh, the future, oh, the future business, future of business in Africa. Here I, I focus on, on the principles that you are standing for, that you are propagating in, in, in South Africa, a market-friendly business environment, massive, massive competition. Um, one of the African leaders around the period of independence said, that the inability of Africa to deal with the, the positive uh, opportunities that competition provides for modernization is going to hold Africa back. And his words have really become uh, true in our current environment. So the termination of market distortion through the so-called empowerment policies, indigenization policies, that's important because there should be um, the, the, the entrepreneur should be allowed to take the risk and have the benefit of the reward for that risk um, without the interference or the protection of the state. Privatization, of course, is still very high on the agenda. And then also the confirmation of the basic tenets of the liberal market. Here we focus on the individual freedoms, the pro property rights, the rule of law, and the um, freedom of movement of the factors of production that labor should be deregulated, the kind of protection that our labor in South Africa is, has is, is not serving the entrepreneurial um, endeavors. Um, the freedom of movement of capital, exchange control should go, um, protection of or the, the constraint around on labor should go. Uh, so entrepreneurs should be able to move and, and operate freely in the rest of the continent. So the sanctity of entrepreneurial risk um, that is what should be protected and should be encouraged because uh, you know that the profit is then the reward for the risk. And that has been, through the history of business in Africa, a golden thread. We've seen it in the period prior to um, colonial control and we should not think that Africa does not have the ability to uh, establish very successful enterprises. The, the long, long history that the book covers shows the prevalence of these characteristics, the rise and the fall of entrepreneurs from which we learn a lot because failures also teach us how to, to improve, but, but the uh, basic presence of a very strong entrepreneurial capacity in Africa I think is the uh, very interesting finding of the, the, the long history that I try to cover in this book. It's not something new, it's been something that's inherent in the African society. So, thank you. Will you take some questions? Yes, I'm welcome. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your talk. I think it's really fascinating to understand the history of African entrepreneurship. Um, so, your thesis, as I understand it, is that uh, in many jurisdictions in Africa, the state has played in an actively inhibiting role in mm. terms of entrepreneurship and, and business activity. Um, but I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Asimoglu and Robinson, uh, Why Nations Fail, is their, their seminal work. And they draw a lot on institutional analysis of people like Douglas North. Mm. And they talk about uh, inclusive and, and extractive institutions. Mm. And really that plays a lot to the role of the elites in these societies mm -hmm. and whether they are treated similarly to ordinary citizens mm -hmm. and held accountable under the rule of law and that the property rights of, of individual citizens are respected. Um, so I'm not sure necessarily that that binary is correct. 
um, you know, in some examples in Africa, the state is actually very weak. Uh, if you think of the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's this vast territorial expanse, and the state actually doesn't have sovereignty over much of that territory. But the elites use their proximity to power to extract rents from, from business, and no business can really function there without some kind of uh, uh, distribution of patronage to, to elites or some extraction of rents. So, um, you know, so I think the story is quite complex. I mean, I think the state has an important role to play in terms of ensuring property rights and the rule of law and also in, you know, creating investments in terms of infrastructure and, uh, you know, you t talk about some examples in South African context of industrial financing. So I, I, I'm not sure what my question is there. Um, I'm rambling a bit. Um, but uh, the question is, I guess, you know, is that binary correct? Is the, um, you know, it does... Can the state play some kind of enabling role? Uh, there's no doubt about my response to your last se sentence that the state can actually play an ena enabling role. But the, the varieties of capitalism literature is actually very interesting here. Um, in the sense that there is no one single model of what capitalism looks like. It always has some kind of adaptation to context. And in Africa, the weakness of institutions, as the Asimoglu Robinson thesis indicates, is really undermining the ability of entrepreneurs to really flourish. But then the question is, why are these institutions weak? In many instances, it is because the state has undermined the erection and the, uh, the sustainability of these institutions because the state has emerged as a strong institution and the state has taken agency in the economy and therefore undermined the other institutions that would nurture the strength of property rights, freedom of individuals and so forth. So um, the the variety of capitalism in Africa, and, and I really hate to generalize because Africa is so vast and it's not the same in each country, but if I may, generally speaking, the overarching role of the state, be it a weak or a strong state, the interference of the state in the economy has undermined the establishment of these institutions. And these institutions have actually been strengthened through colonialism in a certain sense, but the colonial powers did not, res in a responsible way, ensure that they're well established and entrenched before they left. So they, in many instances, sought to strengthen individual uh, institutions, but in many instances couldn't care one but less before they left, and then it, everything collapsed. You, you see, you have to see that Africa then had to grapple with traditional institutions, where they is some respect for property rights, but in the hands of the, of the traditional indigenous leadership. And there is no place for the small man unless he serves under, as I explained in the pre-colonial period, the authority of the authoritarian king and the, the, the sole power of that state. So other types of institutions that we know in the Western environment that we regard, as, as I said towards the end of my talk, as the, the, the foundations of strong economies um, had to be nurtured. And, and those institutions are not typically indigenous African institutions. It's actually in Africa the serious problem of deciding whether African tradition and African culture is going to be the direction or a molding of Western institutions and values that's a serious problem that we need to answer in Africa, and in many instances, it's not easy to answer that. Professor, um, thanks very much for the talk. Um, if I understand your, your thesis to some extent is that uh, state-owned enterprises and government interference and the, has, has failed, and that's now unraveling, and we now have a much better environment for the development of business, you know, your last slide. Um, and hopefully that's correct. But, you know, in Africa, and obviously small and medium enterprises need that sort of deregulation, that open space and competition and so on. But we don't have any capital in Africa, you know, because a lot of it's been, South Africa, we've wasted most of our capital in trying to keep Eskims and things like that going and, uh, 
and some possibilities that will continue to do that. My uh, question I want to ask you is that in this environment, is there not a risk that we might see some recolonization of Africa, that in fact the development that we'll see going forward, if it's not going to be done by governments, will be done by maybe the Chinese or multilateral organizations, World Bank and others coming in and seeing the opportunities here, and that may also not be particularly useful for your thesis of developing a, you know, market enterprise. Um, there is definitely a serious threat of Chinese uh, investment and Chinese intervention because the way the Chinese enter Africa is not an enabling uh, a strategy but um, uh, a strategy of benefiting the Chinese business interest. Um, we all know that they come in with their own labor force and they let them live in a compound. They don't mix, they don't use uh, in local labor. There might be a reason for that. L labor in Africa is perhaps not that disciplined or perhaps not that trained or would, would not work the longer hours or not chasing productivity, whatever the case might be. So there's extensive literature on the extent of Chinese investments, but the, the lack of real uh, skills development and real benefits for actual development in Africa. So th that remains a, a serious problem. Um, but the, the, the recolonization, I, the, the only way I could see recolonization would be the recolonization by business, and you should allow, one should allow big enterprise to use its, its uh, scale to bring the benefit. But remember, I, I don't say that the state has no role to play, that the state's role is important in the sense that it must formulate the conducive policies. So the, the role of the state would be important in saying that the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the entrepreneur should be given uh, uh, access to, 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 to capital, or the, the entrepreneur should be in, encouraged by kind of subsidies for a short period of time. So there can be an enabling environment, but that environment should be an environment where the entrepreneur is finally left to his own. It's not the type of protectionist policies we had in the past, where the protectionist policies uh, result in our industries being uncompetitive because we don't develop technology, we don't chase pr productivity, and we don't pr manufacture competitive products that can compete with the rest of the market. So the openness of the market is important to ensure that the competitiveness is enhanced. And I am I'm confident that we have the capacity in Africa to deliver good products. We have good people. We have wonderful human capital. But um, I, I don't think at, at present um, there is enough uh, agency of the state to protect the entrepreneur in Africa, they, they're too, too easily um, uh, lured by the big investment opportunities that the Chinese offer them. Uh, th that's not, that's not going to, as far as I'm concerned, that's not going to really develop entrepreneurs in Africa. Um, uh, India is India's also making big investment, but in the way that the Indians invest is, is, is different. Um, uh, but I, I yeah, that, those, those are really the, the two largest um, um, foreign direct, sources of foreign direct investment outside the traditional access to the international institutions. I don't think the World Bank and the IMF would recolonize. They would just be you know providing the the prerequisites trying to formulate the, the environment within which these developments should really actually occur. Okay, Maybe a good example of escaping the African problems is the example of Elon Musk, who's escaped from Africa and gone over to America. <laughs> yeah. And is one really recognized as a a world changer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's true, it's true, but I would want to be idealistic in the sense that there may be opportunities in Africa 
for such uh, innovation. If the priorities of the governments in control are correct, we have the intellectual capacity, we have the human capital in South Africa to do immense scientific research, but it's undermined because the National Research Foundation focus most of their funding on social research. And the National Research Foundation has now uh, contracted the funding for rated research by about 80%. So that my effort for re-rating at the National Research Foundation has been um, excessive in the sense of what I get back from the National Research Foundation. No, I've actually decided I'm not going to apply anymore or report back to them because the, the work that is being done is not being rewarded. So the, the policies of, of research and development to nurture technological development, which is the engine of uh, entrepreneurial innovation, we're not doing that. Uh, the, the one thing that, that, that I um, did not say explicitly here is the fact that um, the interference by the state in education is undermining the development of the capacity for entrepreneurial uh, enterprise. So one reads every paper and it says we need more entrepreneurs, more entrepreneurs, and more entrepreneurs. But an entrepreneur needs to analyze context you need analytical thinking. You need the ability to calculate risk. And now the Department of, of uh, high, what, Basic Education is now putting a paper requesting that a pass rate of 30 for mathematics should be sufficient to pass the exam. So we are not building the capacity. We're, we're pushing through people through education without the ability to perform. So the prerequisite for strong business growth in Africa is... High education, if we look at the Southeast Asian model, it was and a Japanese model, Tokugawa, at a major high period 16, uh, after 1688 in Tokugawa and then major in Japan, that was built on optimal high level education. We're not doing that in Africa. So the development of business is undermined by capacity development. Any more questions? Professor Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Thank you. I think everybody's enjoyed it.